Thank you, Emma, and uh, thank you for the invitation to this uh, great event. Uh, always a little intimidating being a Hawke's Bay reed grower at the Sand Mob Conference uh, and talking about organics. But here we go. Quite a bit to get through, just a quick 10 minute slot. So, just want to cover where New Zealand organics um, in our wine industry presently is at. Uh, really, how does this compare globally? Like, how are we doing in, in a bigger, bigger context? What are our consumers up to? And then just a, a, a small area of kind of the nitty gritty in terms of challenges that we face, uh, both viticulturally and wine making. So we presently have uh, just over 1,700 hectares of certified organic um, production in New Zealand, which is only 4.5% of New Zealand's total vineyard area. And uh, that has been in a relatively steady state, but what we've probably seen is that area has increased, but due to kind of 18 to 20% vineyard area increases over time in the last 10 years, it hasn't grown at such a great rate. But what is very positive is actually the number of wineries involved. And really this is the biggest change that we've seen in the last 10 years, whereas it really started in New Zealand as small artesian producers interested philosophically in growing this way. But now we see most of New Zealand's large mainly wineries um, producing grapes organically and some organic wines. So uh, that's a very positive thing. And probably in summary, on a whole, a lot of the conversion to organics in New Zealand has actually largely been driven by viticulture. In terms of our individual regions, actually Central Otago has 16% of their vineyard area in organics, uh, Nelson 8%, North Canterbury and 7%, and the Wairarapa and 7%, so they are at actually higher levels. In terms of our wine production, uh, we presently export about $46 million uh, worth of organic wine and sell about between just under $30 million uh, domestically. But probably more importantly, there's actually a large volume of organic grapes that doesn't make it to certified organic wine. Uh, and this uh, value of volume is actually quite hard to capture. Um, and some of this has actually been purchased in regard to quality levels, not just for organic status. So what's the rest of the world now doing? I remember uh, standing in a conference 10 years ago and New Zealand's organic area was actually up with some of the best in the world. And the truth is, that's not the same today. So um, there's actually over 300,000 uh, hectares of organic grape production in the world and it's hard to get the stats but that also includes uh, table grape production uh, which averages out almost the same in New Zealand at 4.7%. Really the biggest factor is the EU. This is where the largest growth has been and is over 70% of New Zealand's uh, of the world's organic uh, grape production. In terms of percentages, um, Spain is actually leading the way in terms of sheer volume, but really you can probably take the United Kingdom out of their percentages. Uh, and it's basically uh, Austria, <coughs> Spain and France that are the biggest leaders within the EU. And that growth has really um, strived from 2006 to 2011. And um, really that's where, in New Zealand, our growth has actually slowed slightly. So, in terms of our market and what are some of the opportunities, well, it's actually very, very positive. The global market for organic food and produce is actually growing at quite a strong rate, over 10%. Uh, in New Zealand, it's over 8%, which is actually double the rate of conventional produce. And in the USA, sales of imported organic wines have actually increased by over 12% per annum from 2013 to 16. And organics has also been used as a tool for market access. And probably one of the best examples of that is the Swedish alcohol monopoly. In 2013, they actually announced that by 2020, they wanted 10% of their products to be organic. And they've already achieved that goal. So to the sticky end of our industry is our consumers. And really, at the end of the day, 
they can be a picky bunch. We're in a world of conscious values driven consumers. They know what they want, they expect to be able to get it, and they want to connect with products that reflect their values. They are increasingly seeking sustainable and ethical products, and the rise of fair trade is probably an extremely good example of that. And at the end of the day, they hold the consumer power, and that we need to listen and act in the market. And what will our consumers look like in 20 years? I think Brigato this year was, well, last year, was an eye-opener in terms of the, the debate over synthetic wine. In 20 years' time, we will have consumers that have always known that choice. How will our products compare to those consumers? <coughs> and really, what shapes their perception? We've already heard talk today, and I think um, Steve led into it quite well. The rise in debate in the media and to our consumers over how we produce our grapes is of vast interest to us. And I'd be the first to say that um, the way that we grow grapes today will not be found acceptable in the future. And we have to adapt to that rather rapidly. And regardless of how valid some of the details are around those arguments, it is the consumer <coughs> perception that is key, not always the reality. So in the past, we've actually seen um, a very big motivation for conversion from the people actually working the land. And it's really been around that respect for the land, that the nature can reflect these sites in a more authentic way. And that really, as a farmer, you need to think outside the square and keep advancing. And I think you've had a lot of talk so far in this conference about the idea of the concept of terroir and really nailing down to the specifics of what Sydney the Blanc can offer to the consumer. And really, I would argue and I would implore that part of our kind of process of growing and making the wine at the moment actually dulls that ability to be able to do that. So all originally, kind of, it was seen as very much a fringe management but now we're undertaking it on much larger scales and with great success. So what are our challenges? Well, originally in viticulture, and it was very much viticulturally focused, a lot of growers freaked out at the concept of not being able to use herbicide and change that to non-chemical management. Really with the uh, increase in available machinery and techniques, and to be honest, I'd actually just say experience. 10, 20 years ago, we had very little experience with the equipment and the techniques involved with organic underbind management. I think we're far more advanced now, far more confident in doing it far more successfully. So we can bust that myth. Cost of production is another one. We definitely see that the cost of production in organics in the conversion process can be higher, uh, but we find that is often limited to the conversion process. And that some of the increases in the cost of production in the vineyard in terms of undermine management are actually offset by savings in chemicals and other operations. So one of the sticking points, especially for Marlboro Sydney and Blanc, is actually yield. But with some research done this year um, by Bart Arnst, he actually found that over a large range of organic Sydney and Blanc producers, they were averaging uh, about 13 tonne per hectare. At the same time, they were actually receiving approximately $300 more per tonne in grape prices for the, what they were producing. But I think in my experience, in terms of Sauvignon Blanc and organic production, the consistency of yield is what we're most challenged with. And that's, I think, something that we're still learning and um, really fine-tuning our ability to make that uh, much improved. But if the reality is uh, our growing system has to change, those cost of productions might just be a given for everybody. Winemaking also comes with its challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is different organic standards for different markets. Uh, these create a lot of complexity in the winery. Um, we've got some kind of distinct examples with some uh, countries having different sulphite addition uh, restrictions, uh, copper, 
Uh, also, the use of obviously post ferment uh, great concentration for sugar balance would need to be organic. And really, a lot of these actually have quite a significant impact on producing the style of marvellous and the new blog we presently make. But there are those that are doing it very, very well, and not just on a small scale, so it is possible. So what are our opportunities? Well, at the end of the day, we really want to look after our most valuable assets, <coughs> our land, and we want that to be producing exciting wines for a long future ahead of us. We really want to produce fruit with great resilience and quality. And uh, it was interesting to hear Steve talking about the effects of the uh, herbicide on detritus because there's actually some very exciting research in New Zealand uh, recently uh, that has showed that it's uh, a very big correlation between uh, lack of botrytis and ground cover environment. So watch that space. We want to produce wines that truly reflect our terroir. And at the end of the day, we want to look after ourselves. We want staff to be working in a happy and safe environment. We need to plan for the future now. And uh, at the end of the day, we really, realistically, Marlborough is coming into a long series of redevelopment. We know we have a history of grapevine trunk disease, of virus, and other issues in our vineyard. And we have 30 to 40 years of vineyard planting ahead of us. So we need to plan for the future. We need to make these vineyards set up in the right designs to produce wine organically. And this comes down to things like fairy drip line to not grow weeds in the first place. It comes down to having the right vine densities to have consistent yields. It's not, not too difficult. We need to protect and strengthen our New Zealand, the New Zealand brand. We need to champion our unique environment. And at the end of the day, organics is profoundly simple. It is a definable concept. In its simplest terms, it means growing without synthetic products. We need to focus on quality and value over volume. I'm sure that's going to be thrashed out in the days to come. And we need to meet the market. So great wine is in our nature, and um, I'd definitely like to uh, do a little small plug that we do have our Organic Wine Growers and Biodynamics Conference the 25th and 27th of June back in here. So in terms of uh, being able to come along and actually thrash out some of the details in a, in a lot more rigorous way, come along. But New Zealand Sap Blanc is something that's very unique, unique and extremely special and it's put us in such an enviable, enviable position in the global market. And let's not stand still, let's be proactive and make decisions for our industry in the long term. Thank you.